Good afternoon to you all. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us for one more talk of the first cycle of lectures on cognitive linguistics, research and trends. Today, we have Elena Semino from Lancaster University with us on the topic of metaphors and cancer. Five years ago, myself and Eloisa Feltz from Universidade de Caxias do Sul at the time, had the chance and privilege to work in a partnership with Professor Semino in a cognitive linguistics and corpus linguistics international project on the representation of urban violence in the Brazilian media. I have fond memories of that time. So it is especially a happy occasion for me to have Elena today with us. But before I pass the words to you, Elena, let me just read a few uh, words uh, of your outstanding academic career for the information of our audience. Elena Semino is professor of linguistics at Lancaster University and director of the European and Social Research Council Center for Corpus Approaches to Social Sciences. She holds a visiting professorship at the University of Fuzhou in China. She specializes in corpus linguistics, medical humanities, health communication, stylistics, narratology, and metaphor theory and analysis. She has co-authored 100 academic publications, including Metaphor in Discourse, published by Cambridge University Press in 2008, uh, Figurative Language, Jean and Register, by Cambridge University Press, uh, 2013, and Metaphor Cancer and the End of Life, a corpus-based study by Routledge, 2018. In the periods, uh, from 2011 to 2014 and 2015 to 2018, she has uh, been head of the uh, Lancaster's Department of Linguistics and English Language, which is currently ranked among uh, the one of the best universities uh, in the world, uh, ranking a number 12 in the world uh, for linguistics. So, Elena, uh, I pass on the words to you now and be very welcome. Thank you for your availability to be with us. Here we go. Can you hear me? Okay. So, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, I, ha I have really fond memories of visiting uh, Brazil in 2015. Um, and uh, I really wish I could be there with you, but at the same time, it's great to have these opportunities uh, to speak to, in some ways, many more people uh, because of the circumstances we're all in and because of using uh, uh, live webinars instead. Um, so thank you all very much, whatever time zone you're in, uh, for um, being here. Uh, bear in mind that I'm sharing my screen so I can't see the chat. Uh, so if something is wrong, uh, please unmute yourselves and tell me, otherwise I won't be able to um, know. Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, talk to you about a project uh, that with colleagues uh, I spent quite a few years uh, working on at uh, Lancaster University on Metaphors and Cancer. Um, and if you're here, if you know that clearly you, you knew the title, I have uh, quotes from people with cancer in my talk, so I do bear that in mind, because obviously um, the topic is very sensitive and very personal. Okay, why did we do this project? Um, well, we started off with an awareness of um, what might be described, at least in, in the UK, and I think in other countries as well, uh, the dominant metaphorical framing for having cancer tends to be one that is antagonistic, where the cancer is a kind of enemy or opponent that the person who is ill needs to beat. And what you have uh, here are some examples. We have uh, together, we will beat cancer, which is from a charity slogan, a card, uh, keep calm, fight, fight cancer and win. We have uh, the beginning of an obituary for uh, a very famous comedian in the UK, Victoria Wood, who was described as having died after a short battle with cancer. And then even when 
uh, words like war or fight or battle are not explicitly mentioned, you get these um, kind of antagonistic framings. So the, uh, the remaining example on the slide is cancer, we're coming to get you, which was the slogan of a uh, yearly race that is done to uh, in the UK to raise money uh, for breast cancer in particular. And uh, if, if you read those words, cancer, we're coming to get you, uh, it, it sounds like uh, cancer is some kind of opponent that needs to be put in its place and beaten up. Um, so, so this is where we sort of started from, uh, this awareness. And we were also aware that this kind of metaphor, which sometimes is described as a war metaphor or military metaphor, even though, as you can see, it has many different variants. We were aware that this metaphor is controversial and many of you will be familiar with uh, Susan Sontag's very uh, famous book, Illness as Metaphor, where she criticized the use of military type metaphors for cancer and for TB, particularly for the effects that they have on patients. We had also collected um, uh, personal uh, objections to this metaphor. So this is a journalist uh, who had cancer in uh, 2005. And she, again, she wrote a piece pointing out that uh, the, the language that was used uh, about her illness was to do with fighting. And she questioned the metaphor explicitly, saying, why should people with cancer be expected to take up arms? It is better to see cancer as a journey. Everyone says that being positive helps you to come through. And being positive during a journey seems easier to me than being positive during a war in which the enemy is all around you. So here you can see that she explicitly questions uh, the metaphor of fighting against the cancer. Uh, and then she says, on the grounds that it's difficult to feel positive if you're surrounded by war, and suggests instead the metaphor of cancer as a journey, as something that enables people to feel positive. Indeed, in the UK, even before we started our project, uh, the uh, National Health Service um, had adopted in its uh, official policy documents the metaphor of cancer as a journey. So you have it there, living with and beyond cancer. There's a reference to cancer journey, and there are references to pathways. So uh, at this point already, uh, fighting metaphors were being avoided, at least in policy documents in the UK, and the metaphor of the cancer journey was used instead. So this may not be necessary for most of you, but since I don't know you, uh, let me, before I go into the description of the project, let me define metaphor and say why it is important to study metaphors, particularly when we're talking about very sensitive personal topics where uh, metaphorical framings could have, uh, to, could make a difference to how people uh, experience their illness. So as you know, metaphor involves talking and potentially thinking about one thing in terms of another where, where the two things are different, but we can perceive a similarity or correspondences between them. Crucially, and we've already seen it, different metaphors frame the topic in different ways, highlighting some aspects and backgrounding others. And if you're familiar with Lakers and Johnson's conceptual metaphor theory, which has been developed uh, by many others over the years, uh, they, they emphasize how the choice of metaphor, whether battle or journey, for example, has implications for how we understand the topic that we apply the metaphor to. And indeed, there is a lot of empirical evidence. People do studies where they ask uh, people uh, the same questions after exposing them to different metaphors for the same topic. And they find time and time again that uh, the uh, answers differ in ways that show the effect of uh, the metaphors that people were exposed to. So this, this was the kind of background against which we carried out our study. The study was funded uh, by the uh, UK government via the uh, Economic and Social Research Council. Uh, I'll introduce my colleagues in a moment. And this is the data we looked at. So as you can see from the horizontal uh, black um, uh, row, we looked at the language used by three groups of people, patients with cancer, family carers, so people who look after somebody who has cancer, but uh, uh, unpaid, just to look after a family member, a close relative, a friend, uh, and healthcare professionals. 
And for each group, sort of vertically, we had two types of data. We had semi-structured interviews and online forum posts. The numbers you see on the slide are uh, the number of words in each section. Um, I should say that I've given uh, a talk, talks with this slide in many different uh, contexts to many different audiences. And um, uh, one time when I was speaking to um, uh, healthcare researchers and practitioners, when they saw this slide, they became very agitated and I couldn't understand why until I realized that they thought that the numbers were the numbers of interviews uh, and forum posts. So they, they were wondering how we could have interviewed 100,000 patients. So I've learned when you speak, when you do interdisciplinary projects, you can't make any assumptions. So uh, you can probably see in the line on online forum posts that there's an imbalance between the number of words for patients and carers, where we have about half a million each and only a quarter of a million for healthcare professionals. This is to do with the, we only looked at online forums that were uh, available without a password or registering. Uh, and there were many more. Uh, in fact, we had a lot of choice of patients and carers, less for healthcare professionals. But overall, we ended up with one and a half million words. Uh, I, I haven't got in this particular presentation the methodology that we used, but in brief, you can't analyze in detail all the metaphors in such a large corpus. So what we did was we carried out a manual analysis of a sample from the data. So we, we took a sample from the data, about 90,000 words in total, and uh, used the metaphor identification procedure to identify similes in that data. And then we used corpus linguistic methods to scale up in different ways uh, the uh, analysis of the whole corpus so that we analyze the corpus systematically, although we cannot say because of using corpus methods that we found everything. Uh, I'm going to focus particularly on patients. So here are my colleagues um, who helped build the corpus and analyze the data. And you can see that there are linguists, uh, computational linguists, uh, and a healthcare researcher and an oncologist. So, and for this work, we need an interdisciplinary uh, team. Right, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, except you can see there's lots of numbers. Um, on the left hand side, under metaphors, you have the main types of metaphors, you may want to call them source domains, that uh, we identified, the main 10 that we identified in the corpus. What we call violence uh, includes uh, battles, fights. Um, physical struggles, wars, etc. It's very general. Then there's journey metaphors, restraint metaphors, animal metaphors, openness, sports and games, religion and supernatural, obstacles, wholeness and machines. These were the main ones. I won't go through the numbers, except that we found that for all groups in all data sections, violence metaphors, uh, which include wars and battles, and journey metaphors were the most frequent. And actually, patients use what we call violence metaphors, more frequently than the other two groups, in particular, more frequently than healthcare professionals. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time looking at that in a moment, why that is and what the uh, implications might be. So before I go into more detail, I'll just give you some examples of metaphors uh, from the patient data here. When I say metaphors, I include metaphorical expressions and similes. So uh, one person writing on, in, on the online forum says, Am I pathetic wanting that or what? But I feel like a prisoner with all the rules about don't eat this, don't do that. So here the person is using the simile of a prisoner to uh, express their frustration at all the different constraints on the person's life as a consequence of being ill. And notice that here it's not the illness itself that is constraining the person. It's the rules that come from being a cancer patient. And this is quite common that the, the metaphors, including the antagonistic ones, are not necessarily always about the illness, but they're about what comes with the illness, including treatment and other things. Uh, some metaphors are uh, humorous and lighthearted. In fact, we didn't expect to find so much humor, but we ended up writing quite a lot about humor and humorous metaphors on the forum. So this person says, my blog's updated if you need proof that this chemo, the chemotherapy, and the similes about the chemotherapy is like a visit to the fairground. 
dodgems, ghost train, waltzer, dive bomber, and roller coaster all combined in one ride. At least I've not been sick yet. And then the next one, uh, more heart rending, uh, a, a woman who says that uh, she explained to her children that um, the chemotherapy helps her to, to kill her dragons. And she says her children are into Star Wars. And so mummy was the biggest dragon slayer in town. More specifically to do with the cancer, probably not as a surprise, uh, the cancer itself is metaphorized as a beast, a monster or a demon. So, and here you can see that there are different types of opponents, some of them sort of uh, semi-mythological or supernatural. But also, and this is crucial, the cancer is also sometimes personified in a more lighthearted way, such as Mr. C, uh, one woman calls her cancer hefty because she uh, recalls that the oncologist who operated on her said that it was a hefty tumor. And so then she uses that as the nickname for the cancer. And another woman calls her cancer buttercup. I'm saying this because um, one of the things we found and one of the, the kind of aspects of resilience uh, amongst people, especially on the online forum, was using humor, including humorous or lighthearted metaphors. And we, we have many of them. Okay, so now I'm going to say something about our findings to do with violence and journey metaphors in our data. And the reason why I look at these is that, as I said at the beginning, uh, violence metaphors, wars, battles, etc., have been uh, uh, discussed for a long time in relation to cancer. And we found that the most frequent uh, in, the, uh, in our data, including particularly in the sections that reflect the patient's language. And journey metaphors are the second most frequent in most sections of the corpus, but also they are the ones that are most commonly um, chosen as a replacement for, cancer metaphor, uh, for violence metaphors. And we've seen it in, in the quote from the journalists and also for the NHS. So here we are, right. So first of all, we found evidence in our data uh, to support the people who say that violence metaphors can be um, uh, harmful for, for patients. And this applies particularly when uh, uh, a patient doesn't recover. So uh, this is someone writing on the online forum. She's just said that her cancer has spread. And then she comments, I feel such a failure that I'm not winning this battle. So here you can see that the person describes herself as a failure in a context where it is not her who has failed. It's the treatment that has failed or the illness is particularly difficult to cure. But notice that the what follows failure is that, that I'm not winning this battle. So here we have some textual evidence that within the, the battle or as we call it, violence framing, uh, the outcomes can be victory or defeat. And if one doesn't win, then one can draw the inference that they maybe weren't strong enough or didn't fight hard enough. And this is made explicit by this other person who says, I sometimes worry about being so positive or feel I'm being cocky when I say I will fight this. As I think, oh my God, what if I don't win? People will think, ah, see, I knew she couldn't do it. So this is very explicit, an explicit reflection on the use of fighting and uh, what the consequences might be if, if the person doesn't get better. Um, so these are what we call disempowering uh, metaphors, uh, uses of the violence metaphor. However, and this is equally important, um, oh yeah, I should also mention, uh, so probably some of the most negative self-descriptions we found uh, where when people um, are um, uh, cancer-free, but they're worried about the recurrence, when they describe themselves as a time bomb, uh, like this person, I'm a walking time bomb, and or they, they describe others uh, who have cancer, someone close to them, as time bombs. Uh, living with a ticking time bomb is not easy. And these are metaphors. You will see when I go along that um, we try to approach to to uh, adopt a descriptive, not a prescriptive approach to uh, um, communication about cancer. Uh, but this is a particularly negative metaphor that I could not see could be used in a in an empowering way. Um, and so when we speak with um, healthcare professionals, we suggest that this is 
one that, that maybe should be challenged, uh, partly by saying, well, a time bomb is entirely unpredictable, but uh, the patient can be monitored so that uh, it, they, whatever recurrence might be discovered early enough. And certainly the consequence of a recurrence is not immediate uh, massive disruption like in the case of a time bomb. However, um, it is all, we also found that for some people, some of the time in some circumstances, uh, violence metaphors can be empowering. People find can find meaning, uh, a sense of identity and motivation. So one person says cancer and the fighting of it is something to be proud of. Another person in an interview, she says, I don't intend to give up. I don't intend to give in. No, I want to fight it. I don't want it to beat me. I want to beat it. So here you can see the transitivity reversal. There is a sense of uh, motivation of uh, identity in being someone who uh, uh, tries to beat the cancer. When we looked at journey metaphors, we found something similar. It should be recognized that we did not find any cases where the journey metaphor can be harmful uh, for morale, for self-perceptions in the way that we have found violence metaphors can be. However, they work for some and not others. So. This is a positive, empowering use of a journey metaphor. Uh, my journey may not be smooth, but it certainly makes me look up and take notice of the scenery. So here you can see that the person is using a particular aspect of the source domain of journeys. In other words, the fact that you can enjoy looking around at the scenery while you're traveling. The person is using that to point out something potentially positive in what is in fact a negative experience, i.e. having cancer. And that is, and many people do say that, that even in something that is very distressing and very difficult to live through, uh, people might appreciate uh, uh, their uh, lives more and might make meaningful connections with other people because of the cancer. So this is an empowering um, use of the journey metaphor that is uh, a particular affordance of journey uh, as a metaphor. However, some people some people just don't like journey metaphors. They find them cliched. And some people use them to, to express frustration, like this person who says, how the hell am I supposed to know how to navigate this road I do not even want to be on when I've never done it before? So you can see an unwanted trip and a road that is unknown. So this is a disempowering use of the journey metaphor. OK. Um, the other thing I briefly want to show you was how metaphors, including similes, uh, were used, I've already mentioned this, to, to express uh, perceptions of changes of identity uh, as a consequence of having cancer, but also as a consequence of having uh, treatment for cancer. Right, so um, one of the things that people do is they compare themselves to an older person. Uh, especially here to, to describe the uh, physical consequences of being ill. So this person says, I'm okay on the flat, but I can't cope walking up hills. Feel like I'm 90, 90 years old sometimes, lol, right? It's comparing themselves to an older person. Uh, uh, the next example, my pain is getting worse and this morning my back seems to have given way on me. I feel and look like an old lady. Okay, there's a bit of ageism going on here too, but you can see that people uh, feel that their identity has changed uh, to make them older. However, there are also comparisons with younger people. The first one is from uh, somebody who uh, contributed a lot to uh, one of the threads uh, on the online forum we studied that was dedicated to humor. And part of the humor was uh, to do with um, uh, wearing a stoma bag after bowel cancer um, uh, uh, and, and, the, and the bag making noises um, uh, in, in socially awkward situations. And so this person says, and rather than be mortified like most, being me, I revert to being like your average five-year-old and find it hilarious when it starts far farting really loudly with no control whatsoever. So here you can see um, comparing yourself or feeling like a much younger person, like a child, in order to cope with something that otherwise would be very difficult to cope with. So as a coping mechanism, uh, switching your identity to someone much younger. 
A different example of comparing yourself to somebody much younger uh, has a very different uh, 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 framing in terms of empowerment. So one of the things that uh, people talk about, especially on the forum, is uh, the challenges that they have communicating with uh, doctors, um, oncologists, surgeons, etc. So uh, this person is uh, trying to comfort another one and says, I am so sorry to hear about all the mets and recurrences. I really don't think you're at all to blame. Notice this, right? Saying you're not to blame as if it was an assumption that or the person was assuming that they are. But I know that feeling of the consultant looming over you like a naughty schoolgirl. So here, comparing an adult person to uh, a naughty schoolgirl as uh, the consultant makes her feel by being critical or by appearing to be critical uh, is, is something that expresses, suggests a problem sometimes in, in the relationship um, between the patient and the doctor. And I think this comes up over and over again, the idea, I, I think most of us can relate to it, that somehow uh, we want to please our doctors by recovering, by being good patients and being well. And so clearly sometimes people here feel judged uh, rightly or wrongly if they don't get better. Um, and you can see how much um, guilt, sort of additional negative feelings are being expressed by the metaphors. Then there are comparisons with animals, and I think they are a little bit similar to, in terms of their variety, to the ones, uh, the comparisons with young children. So, um, uh, the, in the first example, somebody is comparing herself uh, with hair growing back after chemotherapy to looking like a poodle, right? So, this is based on a visual similarity, and it is relatively lighthearted. The other two are about... Uh, uh, are animal metaphors about disempowerment, again, due to something in the institutional healthcare setting. So the second example, doctors, especially ones that seem to have the power over your life and death, do seem to be pretty scary people. They use a lot of long words and you probably sit there like a bunny in the headlights. So this is a, a conventional expressions and you just don't know what to ask them. So this suggests uh, a sense of, uh, uh, to put it even more metaphorically, paralysis, disempowerment in the context of communication with the doctor. Um, yeah, the, the final example here, one radiographer who knew the exact way to help me off the table, right? This is after x-rays or CT scans. Most left me there like a beached whale. So this is another conventional simile, but it gives a sense of embarrassment, disempowerment and loss of dignity. Uh, in, in that context. Um, so I've already hinted at this, but the, the, the two main types of metaphors, violence metaphors and uh, journey metaphors, also provide uh, roles, identities for uh, people with cancer. And uh, we focused amongst others on fighter, which is the role of the patient in, in violence metaphors, battles, fights, wars, and so on. Now, interestingly, um, when uh, patients use this metaphor to describe themselves, to describe others, um, addressees or other people, or to describe a whole group, um, it's always in a positive sense, right? My consultants recognize that I was a born fighter. You're such a fighter. Your husband sounds like you're such a fighter. Like, your husband sounds like a fighter. And then in the final one, are there any other younger bowel cancer fighters amongst us. So it's usually used in a positive sense uh, to praise people. And the focus of fighter uh, as, as a, a metaphorically used noun, and it applies across uh, uh, beyond cancer, is not so much on the opponent, but it suggests um, determination, not giving in. So that is what is expressed. So when it's used, it's used positively. And it's primarily used by patients. It's not really used by doctors in our data or nurses. Um, however, the downside of that is that if that is the metaphor that is used when uh, uh, the person isn't getting better, then it can have the consequences that we've seen. And indeed, because we can't avoid COVID and I'm working on metaphors for COVID, um, 
there was a lot of discussion when Trump uh, was ill about the fact that he was described as strong, too strong for the virus, he's going to beat it. Um, and he, of course, played into that uh, particular persona. And of course, then it suggests that uh, getting better is something to do with character that, in fact, is not the case. It's certainly not the case for COVID. It's actually really not the case for cancer either. Um, and it can have both positive consequences. Somebody is lucky to get the best treatment and recover, but also negative consequences that we've seen. Uh, within the journey metaphor, the, the obvious role for the sick person is that of a traveler. And those are, that term is used on the online forum uh, also as a greeting, uh, happy Easter fellow travelers, etc. And sometimes that idea of traveling together is something that is exploited to um, uh, express a sense of commonality amongst people on the forum. So the rocks in our pods are easier to handle when we're, all, when we're all in it together. My biggest learning point from the whole cancer experience is that the best people to help you are the ones who've been there before you or are heading there with you. So journey metaphors, but fight metaphors also, but journey metaphors are often used for this sense that we're traveling together, we're on the same road. Uh, however, uh, there are other possible roles that one can take in a journey scenario, and a different one is passengers. And here I won't read the whole quote, but uh, the person is talking about passengers nearing the end of the journey and those recently having finished their journey. And here the passenger is not somebody who can control the, uh, the, the, the movement of, of uh, the vehicle. They can't control their journey. So uh, uh, there are different roles that suggest different degrees of um, control and per perception of uh, power. Okay, so um, I've got one final bit before I go uh, just beyond the conclusions. So I've shown you how uh, metaphors and similes are used by patients in particular to convey their experiences, perceptions of identities and changes in identity, but also to reinforce social bonds, particularly through humor. And I've shown, but those of you who study metaphor know already, metaphors are neither good nor ba bad in themselves. They can both be helpful and harmful in this context. It depends on how they're used. And even uh, if violence metaphors can be harmful uh, and journey metaphors don't, uh, we haven't found any potentially harmful uses, even violence metaphors are not negative for everyone and journey metaphors are also not positive for everyone. So the crucial thing is to recognize that uh, while violence metaphors should not be imposed on anyone, different metaphors work differently for different people and people should be encouraged and en enabled to use uh, the metaphors that work best for them. And I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to tell you uh, about a practical initiative that we took precisely based on this final point. Uh, we uh, launched uh, a, a resource for patients that we call the metaphor menu for people with cancer. I'll just tell you how it came about. Um, so um, when we, we were doing the project, um, we had um, in, in the UK, but I imagine in lots of other places, we obviously were under pressure to, to engage with people outside academia and if possible, um, uh, achieve some benefit, societal benefit. Um, and in this particular case, regardless of any institutional pressures, it meant a lot to us and to me personally that um, we did something practical um, uh, with the work that we were doing. And the challenge came from um, a member of a group of people, local people here in the Lancaster area in the northwest of England, who um, we met regularly. There were people usually slightly older who had experience of cancer, um, either themselves or uh, close uh, relatives. And we met them about every three months and we just discussed what we were doing and got some feedback, which was great because um, we got feedback that was different from the kind of feedback that we get uh, when we talk about amongst ourselves as academics. And on a particular meeting, um, we had been presenting some of the work similar to what I've just done with you. And one of the members of that group, uh, a local lady said, right, okay, so what are you going to do with all of this? Are you going to come up with something practical and useful, such as a list of good metaphors and a list of bad metaphors so that people know what to do? And 
um, and I sort of was slightly taken aback. And and then I said, uh, and you won't be surprised having heard my talk, that I said, yeah, that would be great, but but it's not really going to be possible because what we have found is that it's not the type of metaphor itself that is negative or positive, except for time bomb that we couldn't really find a positive use for. But it's really about how the metaphor is used and also different people find meaning in different metaphors. So we can't really do uh, come up with a list of do's and don'ts. You know, we, we, we obviously we are, you're all aware that as linguists, we tend to have a descriptive, not a prescriptive approach on language use. So that was the answer I gave on the day. But when I then came home here and um, I wasn't that happy with myself in the sense that I felt that I had uh, given what you might describe uh, the classic academic answer. I basically said to this lady, um, it's much more complicated than you think. And so I then thought, how can we meet the spirit of that question? Uh, i.e., are you going to do something useful with all these metaphors you've studied? Uh, even if I couldn't meet the letter of the question, which was a list of good and bad metaphors. And that's where I came up with the idea of making a metaphor menu for people with cancer. The metaphor menu is a collection of quotes from our data and from other sources, accompanied by images that we had made for us. And the idea, of course, is a metaphorical menu. The idea is the idea of choice. In a restaurant, the menu provides different options. Not everybody will like the same thing, but and that it's okay, but everybody hopefully will find something they like. And actually this particular menu is also aimed at uh, encouraging people to come up with their own recipes. So uh, encouraging people to invent their own metaphors. I'll give you some examples. Oh yeah, the, the metaphor menu looks like this. Um, it exists as a booklet and also as a pack of cards. And we've done events when it was still possible to do events uh, with different groups. Um, uh, I, uh, it is downloadable uh, from our project website. I can put it in the chat in a minute if you're interested. And uh, I actually, um, until before the pandemic, I, I, I would send uh, versions of this if people want them for teaching or um, to use with patients or as I say students. And I, I can still do that if you're interested. I'll give you two examples of metaphors in the menu. Uh, we've already seen the fairground. Here's another one. Imagine it like a bit like a scary fairground ride. It might be scary in places, but it will eventually stop and you can get off. Be strong, be brave, and it will be here to hold your hand if you need it. And this one is probably my favorite a musical metaphor. Cancer is part of me. The cure for cancer is accepting it. To heal is to convince the cancer cells to sing in tune with the rest of the body. So the idea is people who might be interested, look at this. And, and we also have some journey and some fight metaphors, but empowering ones, because obviously we need to make sure that we don't inadvertently cause harm to people. So it was difficult to come up with a final set. But um, the idea is to give people either validation if people say, ah, that's how I feel too. It's good to see someone else feel like this or inspiration. Okay, I hadn't thought about it like that. Uh, this is helpful to me. And in some cases, I might say, no, this doesn't work for me. Or actually, I can come up with my own metaphor now that I've seen what other people do. And indeed, we've had really good feedback when we've done events. We launched it um, about a year ago. Um, this is uh, somebody from Northwest Cancer Research saying that it's useful. Um, and this is a patient. Uh, as a previous cancer patient and the daughter of a cancer patient, I feel so relieved that I needn't force myself to always fight with it. I can just live with it in balance. Cancer is a partner. And so you can see she comes up with her own metaphor. This is someone who came to one of our events. And uh, Cancer Research UK, one of the two largest uh, cancer charities in the UK, recommends it on their website. So, and as I say, uh, now it's, been, it's also been translated in Portuguese, actually, by... Um, people in Portugal. Actually, no, uh, uh, they're not translating it. It would be wrong to translate it. They're collecting metaphors to make a Portuguese menu, but that's uh, European Portuguese. Uh, and that's it. Uh, thank you very much. This is, uh, we've, as you can imagine, we've done some publications. We've got a book uh, that is here, uh, Publisher Routledge and lots of uh, articles, but I think I'm going to um, 
stop sharing anyway, uh, so that uh, you can ask me some questions. Almost all the publications are open access, so you can just um, go on my website and download them. So you won't have any problems doing that. Okay, that's it, guys. Thank you, Elena. I'm back in my smartphone because, uh, you know, my Wi-Fi connection is not good at all. Anyway, uh, well, it's time for questions and answers. So uh, if anybody would like to ask a question, please switch on your mic and ask a question directly, please. If you can. Can, can I just respond while people speak? I'll just open the chat. And, uh, Florian or, else, or else over the chat. Yes. No, 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 but uh -huh. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I, I've just seen it in the chat. Um, uh, somebody says, I wonder if we couldn't do something similar with COVID. We are doing something similar with COVID. Uh, there's an international initiative called Reframe COVID. Um, uh, if, you, if you Google Reframe COVID, you'll find the website. There is a, an international initiative to collect different methods. Good. Yeah, but anyway, Good. I'm happy, happy to take questions. <laughs> yes. Does anybody want to say, to ask a question? Uh, Francisco does. All right. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, great. Yes, um, my mic was on. So, this is a very suggestive talk. Thank you a lot, Elena. And I'm so glad that I was able to take part yeah, as a member of the audience. Um, I, I was uh, wondering about something. Um, have, you, um, have you thought about investigating the difference in your purpose between using simile with like and using simply the metaphor? Because with your, on the basis of your data, I could see that sometimes when the speaker was like saying something like, um, I, I am a fighter or, or you have to be a fighter, not like a fighter. But for example, when he compared himself with a poodle, it was like a poodle because yeah. he didn't feel like he was a poodle. So maybe there's something about the differences between like, simile and, and metaphor that would be relevant for your purpose. Yeah, I think, the, so the short answer is no, we, we didn't uh, do a, a comparison between uh, metaphorical statements and similes, and, and partly quite a lot of the, uh, the metaphors we had, as you can imagine, they weren't noun metaphors or, or anything like that. But it would be really interesting to do that. I've actually done that with a different um, data set where people talk about um, the uh, experience of psychosis. So, and I've started comparing similes with uh, metaphorical expressions. And I think um, you can usually uh, do uh, uh, something with the explanation that, for example, has been provided by the career of metaphor hypothesis, that the, the, the more novel comparisons are more likely to be expressed by similes and the more conventional uh, um, expressions uh, are, are expressed as, as met metaphors. But this is just basically based on a different mm -hmm. thing. That you're absolutely right that it is something that we could do, yes. Mm. Another thing that I, that I could see from your corpus is that you, you gave incidental evidence that the famous invariance principle that Lakoff postulated many years ago um, is, is not complete. It needs something else. Um, because, for example, with, with, with a journey metaphor, if you, if you think of a journey, you want to get somewhere. Yeah. But in the journey metaphors, oh, the patient simply <laughs> moves with, with, with the, goes with the tide, right? Yeah. Uh, lets himself or herself go. So something else is needed, like invariance and then maybe relevance conditions. Yeah, something. maybe. I think with that, we did look at whether the journey had an endpoint. And, uh, and I think, as you can imagine, for a lot of people where there was an endpoint, where there was a destination, it was um, getting better. So, so basically, a recovery was the destination. Mm -hmm. um, and then for some people, it was death. Um, uh -huh. but, but what you're saying is interesting because um, one of the things that comes out, not just from our corpus, but from talking with oncologists, is that, and many of you will know, um, that some cancers, now that there's better survival rates, but not necessarily cure. So for many people, cancer is becoming a long-term illness. Almost some cancers like prostate cancer or some lymphomas are almost like chronic illnesses. Mm -hmm. So that basically if it's a journey, then it's a journey that becomes sort of part of life's journey, but, but it doesn't have a recovery as a destination. 
but also it's unlikely to be the thing that kills you. So, so that then the journey, it's, it's a travel rather than uh, the destination. Mm -hmm. So you're right that there may be something. It, to it's do a with never it. ending journey until, yeah, yeah. until you life. die, maybe yeah. or something else. Yeah. Something else. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, Thanks. that's really, that's really helpful. Thank you. There is a few questions. Yeah, some of these are already put else put into the metaphor menu. Thank you for doing that for me. Okay. That is interesting. I would like to have a uh, chance to download the, the, the menu myself. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's there. It's there for everyone. You'll see that what, the only thing I say is that if you use Good. it, it would be nice if you let me know. Uh, I am happy. We, we make it. Oh, sure. They're downloadable for everyone because we want it to be useful. But if you do anything with it, be, let me know. Send me an email. It'd be nice to know. Exactly. Yes. Are there any okay. other questions? Well, there are a people in the audience that work with uh, cancer metaphors here in Brazil. Um, there are, the, you are the second person who talk on the subject for us. And there is still another talk to come okay. by Maria Gra Grazia Rossi. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Maria Grazia. She's also going to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Hey, actually, okay. Maria Grazia, uh, Ali Maria Bani Grazia works... works in Lisbon, so she's involved in um, the initiative to, collect, to create a, a, a Portuguese uh, metaphor menu. Good. Yes, she'll be talking yeah, to great. us uh -huh, soon, uh, in yeah, November. Yeah, that's really great. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, Okay, Aline, you can't open your camera, but can you use your microphone? Oh, she says, uh, I'd like to say that Elena's project has been a great inspiration on our project. It's great to hear, thank you. It's great to hear. Yes, they're also working We definitely can't understand no. you. I can't understand you, Alini. No. There's too much noise at the same time. We can't hear your voice. Wi-Fi connection is not helping anybody today. That's right. Yes, it's stopping. We're stopping. Yes, stopping actually. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm very grateful that there is such an initiative, uh, Professor Semino. Uh huh. Okay. Right. Uh, very interesting work, Elena. Uh, and um, I would like to say uh, it's on a different subject. To say that uh, the use of the the violence data by uh, Jean Paulo uh, has helped him uh, do a very good uh, thesis uh, PhD project. Yes, it was very good, good help from Lancaster University to his right. research. Uh huh. Yeah, very great. nice. Uh, okay, can you can you read uh, Aline's comment? Yeah, I can see that. We've found some context influence in the mappings. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, metaphors yeah. of SAR. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. that's, that's yes. great. That's uh -huh. great to hear. It's not surprising. It's good. Yeah. Yes. Um, and and that's one of the I, reasons why you can't translate. It's not a matter of translating, but it's a matter of creating something that is culturally appropriate. Right. Um, so, yeah. I was wondering. Um, you know, on your methodology, it was more of a descriptive kind of methodology, right? You kind of just, you know, look look at the metaphors and try to understand what they were on about as, as they used that metaphor. Okay. Yeah, no, we had, I think the, the main concern for us was what kind of framing was being suggested by the metaphor and what was the position particularly of the patient or the carer within that metaphor? Okay. Uh, within that mm -hmm. metaphorical framing, yeah. Uh, but then right. we had different things. We looked at uh, metaphors for 
bereavement. We looked at uh, metaphors that patients use for healthcare professionals and healthcare mm -hmm. professionals use for patients. So what they said about power relationships, for example, etc. But mostly the idea was, you know, what kind of framings do we have? What kind of inferences, evaluations, right. um, consequences for agency and blame uh, um, come from those particular framings? Yes. How about the practical use of your manual? Has it already been used at uh, you know different um, health care centers and the hospitals and things like that? Yeah, there are. There's an oncologist near here who helped me. Uh, she uses it. There's a hospice. Um, okay. Again, here that do. Um, uh, it's been used in a uh, as part of a resource uh, for women with breast cancer in London. Um, and uh, I have sent it to many places from Mexico to South Africa. Uh, Very when good. people ask me, I send uh, hard copies or that people can download. Um, good. So yeah, uh, one thing is that I, I, I don't always know because people, mm -hmm. because it's available and also mm -hmm. we've done events where we've handed it out and I send it to people. Um, I don't always know when it's being used. That's uh, right. Yeah, but I do know that it has been used. But yeah. but yes, but one thing is that it has been used and it's very yes, good. It yes, because because this is, this is something I I like very much about you know our research that it's not only contained to the university but it will have an application you know yeah. in society. This is very very good, very useful to know. Yeah. Right. Um, does anybody else would like to ask? Uh, uh, Elena, question? Uh, hello. Hi. Hey, hello, my name is Fabio. I'm from San Luis. Hi, Fabio. And hello. And uh, actually, it's a curiosity because there is a TV show called The Big C, the Big C right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know it. Uh, I'd like to know if this expression is, uh, it was a creative expression, a creative metaphor. I don't know. Or if it was created by the producers of the TV show, which was, it's not a common to be said, the, the big C. Yeah, no, I think, I think it, it existed before. I think it is, I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I don't have the precise evidence, but I think it is something that existed before. Uh, the, mm -hmm. you know, using the initial for something that is taboo, but also using big as, a uh, again as a kind of light-hearted thing because humor when you can joke about something it exercises less of a, uh, a restraint on you uh, and so i think it i, th I think it pre-existed so uh so it's not a, a i mean uh it's not a bad expression it is uh it's not positive or negative i i was wondering if this word is negative or positive the big c um, mm -hmm. Well, I think it obviously it depends on, you know, because these things are so emotional that I don't think you can say it's always positive or, or, or always negative. But it does have, because of the use of the initial and because of the use of big, which of course is metaphorical, but, but potentially humorous. I think it has, it's not positive because cancer is still negative, but it is a relatively lighthearted way of referring to it. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh -huh. So, are there any more questions? I was going to ask a question about therapists because the people who work with you, I'm Jean-Rémy Lapère from Bordeaux. Um, I, I wanted to know because the people that who worked with you on the project, I mean, were, were you know predominantly people who were doing linguistics or mathematics or statistics, and but but but, but surely, um, for instance, the guidebook you published or um, the discussions you had with, um, I suppose. Uh, therapists or people um, you know providing psychiatric help must have been really interested in uh, you know empowerment how you know metaphors can really make us I mean they can destroy us but surely and uh, the ones you showed for instance they do the journey metaphors include also the the the, uh, the the battle you know the battle thing can be you know if, if you're like you know you're, you're like determined you're gonna fight etc I mean all this probably um, has an impact on 
on people's you know mental health and it it would be very sad if if such a resource which is which is incredible i mean what you've done is is, is a huge amount of of work and and uh, reflection uh, were kind of underused and not really because I, i'm sure that this must be treasured by by therapists have you had like feedback from people who uh, support people with cancer from you know carers or the medical profession Professor Semin, your mic. Sorry, yes, because basically my internet, my connection um, sort of disappeared halfway through the question, but I got the question. So you can hear me now, right? Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Um, right. So going to the question, uh, have we interacted yeah, with yeah. therapists? Have therapists benefited from what we do? And uh, the answer is yes, to some extent. Uh, we've had feedback uh, from, for example, people who do um, art therapy or creative writing therapy with people with cancer, and the, the menu is then used mm -hmm. as a source of inspiration, and then people go away and write their metaphors or write their stories or draw their pictures. So, so it has been used that way, and I'm aware of some people who use it that way. Uh, we've given copies to uh, some patients who, who run their own groups, um, uh, and so that's that's another uh, place where it has been used. And in the hospice here, I in the hospice in Lancaster and in the UK, basically hospices are uh, primarily look after people at the end of life. They actually gave me a lot of feedback because before launching it, as you can imagine, uh, we spoke to a lot of people. I did workshops, you know, in order to make sure that at least we weren't going to do any harm uh, to anybody. Um, they were inspired to to use the idea because in the hospice most people are, are there because they they're not going to recover whereas the, the metaphors in the menu often leave that option open but but in the hospice they're going to use the same idea to come up with their own thing so yes to some extent that um, has happened and as i was saying before i often don't know and sometimes i find out by complete coincidence that the somebody's using the metaphor menu i you know people don't need to tell me i, I should say uh that and uh, and okay this may you know come across as boasting but just to give you an idea we published a paper early on in in uh, the in a journal that's part of the british medical journal uh, uh bmj supportive and palliative care and that is my most successful publication ever it's only about three and a half thousand words it's on violence and journey metaphors. And um, we were looking at it the other day because of a submission to the university. It was the most read uh, article in that journal for the first 12 months of, of after publication. And it's been downloaded about 17,000 times. That doesn't usually happen to my papers. So, uh, so there is no, and this is for healthcare professionals and, and researchers. So, so there is a lot of interest actually. We, we have found that there is interest. Yes. Good. Um, else? Someone wants to ask a question, just come up with your question. I don't have to be asking people if they want to, to ask a question. Just turn on your mic and, and pick out your Ana, Simone tem uma pergunta, mas, aliás, ela pede que ela fale sobre é, é Simone. Oh, somebody can translate Say English, me. I, I can, sometimes I understand a little bit. Yeah. But... I would like to hear you talk about metaphorical creativity. This is what Simone... Yeah. Metaphorical creativity. Yeah, no, and I do have uh -huh. there is a version of this talk that focuses on, on creativity specifically. Basically, what we found was we found lots of conventional metaphors, the cancer journey, fighter, support, uh, and so on and so on. But the, we also found a lot of creativity, sometimes expressed as similes, uh, going back to my answer to Francisco. Um, but also we found some very extended metaphors. And in some cases, it was what, you would expect that people would use 
creative versions of conventional metaphors such as the violence, the journeys, the fairground. But also sometimes they were completely novel metaphors. So one person has a very long metaphor to do with uh, currencies and market values. And basically the point that they're making is that, the, you know how we say the cancer gets you a hardship, gets you to reevaluate re your life and what matters. And this person has a, a, a metaphor that goes on for paragraphs about uh, um, a new currency market and new values on this currency market, etc. So, so there is um, quite a lot of creativity, and the humorous metaphors tend to be creative. We we actually wrote a paper on uh, a creative use of the idea of playing the cancer card, uh, like using cancer to your advantage. And one group of people writing on the online forum um, uh, uh, develop the cancer card metaphor so that it becomes many cancer cards of different kinds and different things you can do with the cancer cards. Um, so yes, so there is, there is a lot of creativity too. Any other questions? Right, it's your turn now to ask them, <laughs> right. People thanking you, uh, Simone, yes, who asked the question. Thank you, just now. Yeah. So, if there are no more questions, um, I would just like to say a few words before we, you know, say goodbye. Mm -hmm. First of all, Elena, I was very frustrated at the beginning because I was going to, you know, uh, read your uh, the synthesis of your biodata. And right, I still, okay. I'm still going to try. I will, right, okay. No, I, I think I'll record this beginning and ask okay. our, you know, a technical uh, person who, you know, who is able to kind of join different videos to see if he can, you know, come up with a proper introduction for the for the conference. Okay. I was I was kind of frustrated by that. Anyway, okay. um, and um, yes, thank you very much for your time for your availability. Mm -hmm. It was nice seeing you again. Same here. And uh, just, just a moment, moment Monica. And uh, I, as Monica said, we are planning other things for next year. So uh, be on the lookout for another invitation. Yeah, don't worry. I, I'm delighted. Uh, I, I'm very happy. I, I enjoyed giving this talk. I'd be happy to give another one. And uh, one day, Thank you very one day much. I hope I'll visit Brazil again. Yes, uh -huh. we look forward to that, yeah. yes. Well, you have to come to Maranhão, where Monica lives. It's okay. very, very beautiful. Okay, there. that's a deal. The Lençóis Maranhenses, which are I love, I love, fantastic. I love, Brazil. I love Brazil. Monica, it's your turn now. No, I just wanted to congratulate uh, Professor Semino on her talk. And I was going to suggest you, if you wanted to read, uh, the introduction before we uh, finish and... Uh, mm. It's not necessary though, guys, but if you want to do it... It could be, but, uh, it could be, but uh, I think if I kind of, you know, record yeah. this uh, short introduction and we kind of, you know, blend them together in one piece of video, <laughs> it'll be nice. Yeah. Uh -huh. yes. Okay. Uh, I think next week we have Professor um, Augusto from Universidade de Braga, Augusto Silva, and he'll be talking to us about uh, metaphors, emotions, and culture. As far as I remember, he's the, the guest for next week. I'm not with the schedule here in hand. Okay, thank you very much, Elena. Have a okay. nice evening. Good night to thank you all you. there. Bye -bye. Uh -huh. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you.